Good morning, good afternoon, Does, good evening. I don't know what time it is anymore in Davos. How's everyone doing? Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, my name is David Gavis. I'm a managing correspondent for the climate section of the New York Times. I write the Climate Forward newsletter, which I would encourage all of you to subscribe to. Uh, I host our climate events, and I'm contributing to the paper. So we at the Times have a real focus on exploring the climate change story from all angles, including the jobs angle, the business angle, and critically, this issue of what an equitable transition actually looks like. Uh, we know now that the green transition is underway. We see it in the tremendous volumes of resources being poured into the development of renewables, particularly in the US with bills like the Inflation Reduction Act uh, allocating up to you know, a trillion dollars plus investment. We see it uh, in the EU over the last couple years. And of course, we see you know, fits and starts in the developing world where, let's be honest, uh, these transitions are much more difficult given the financing environment, a topic we'll soon get into. But stepping back, uh, it's important to realize that when we talk about sort of the green transition, we're talking about really remaking the modern world, as I think about it. When you think about remaking the energy system, we're talking about the overhaul of the entire way that we power our economies. When we talk about creating a more emissions-friendly agricultural system, that's gonna require huge overhauls of the way we fertilize, the way we farm. When we think about transportation, logistics, heavy industry, construction, all of these industries need to be fundamentally rethought, and that means a fundamental reshaping of workforces around the world. Those are some of the topics we're gonna to get into. We have a really tremendous and distinguished panel to help us think through these critical issues. Uh, joining me is Minister Rania Al-Mashat. Thank you very much for joining us, the Minister of International Cooperation in Egypt. Uh, Luke Triangle, the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation, just here on my left. We have uh, Josu Yon Imaz, the Chief Executive Officer of Repsol. Thank you very much for joining us. And finally, we have uh, Jonas Persing, the CEO of Manpower Group. Thank you very much. You. So all of you, the stakes couldn't be clearer. Uh, Minister, I'd love to turn to you first, if I may. You recently wrote an article titled Climate Financing That Puts People first. And in it, you point out not only that the effects of climate change are unevenly distributed, but that the resources to solve this critical problem are unevenly distributed too. Can you talk a bit more about your thoughts on this issue and, and how it plays into this issue of equity? Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with, with the panel and uh, uh, focus on uh, the equitable transition. And what uh, uh, we highlighted in this uh, article uh, is the concept of just. The, the transition has to be a just transition. And for it to be a, a just transition, uh, the concept of leaving no one behind is very, very mm -hmm. important. And I believe that uh, the buildup uh, of COP27 and COP28 and the narrative that came out of COP28 uh, just uh, two months ago uh, very much uh, focused on the socioeconomic implications of climate change and uh, uh, highlighted and underscored what developing economies have been also reiterating once and again uh, that climate and development should come hand in hand and they should not be mutually exclusive. So this is, uh, I believe, um, uh, a key point. Uh, the other element uh, which links to that is how do you finance uh, such a transition? And here comes the uh, uh, point that many of the emerging economies and the developing economies that have not polluted but now need to also move very fast uh, uh, and boldly uh, with respect uh, to renewable energy or uh, uh, more innovative agriculture, et cetera, uh, also require the financing. And in the world where uh, cost of financing is, is very, very steep, uh, the, there needs to be a realization of uh, additional concessional finance, uh, maybe blended structures to be able to uh, crowd in the private sector so that this concept of leaving no one behind is really translated into um, a transition that uh, creates jobs, a transition that uh, unleashes the potential of the economy, uh, a transition that uh, creates a conducive environment also uh, for private sector engagement. This requires policies from the government side uh, it requires uh, uh, also uh, a lot of uh, work, collective work in the spirit of Davos with uh, different uh, stakeholders. 
uh, be it uh, multilateral development banks, uh, also several of the initiatives that are taking place here uh, this year are related to philanthropy as, uh, again, patient capital that can come in, uh, create uh, pools uh, of grants that actually help in reskilling, for example, or can help in uh, also uh, allowing more private sector uh, engagement. So these are maybe uh, uh, the concepts related to uh, what we tried to put in that article. Uh, again, uh, just transition requires just financing. Socioeconomic implications of the transition require that we also think about leaving no one behind, and therefore financing comes at the core of all of this. Uh, and maybe in my next uh, intervention, I'll be talking about country-led policies and mm. platforms that can actually accelerate this. That's great. Let me just briefly follow up, if I may. I feel like we've been having this conversation for two years or more at least. It's been a couple of years since the Bridgetown Initiative, which was this effort to sort of rethink global finance for climate efforts, started to gain traction. Uh, you wrote this article. It was on the agenda in Dubai. And yet, I, I sometimes struggle as a reporter looking for specifics that I can you know, build an article around to identify real changes that suggest we're moving in the right direction. Do you feel like the global community, the private sector has, has started to make the steps needed to unlock the capital that you just, in the ways you just described, or are we still very much at sort of the theoretical phase? No, I mean, it's, it's uh, in the article you'll see there's a section called From Policy to Practice. Yeah. Uh, so we operationalize this in two very important ways. Um, there is discrepancy across uh, regions and across uh, countries, but nonetheless, there's a lot of onus on the country itself. Yeah. Policies have to be, and um, projects have to be country-led. There has to be uh, a realization of where you want to go. Uh, and therefore, be very clear on the projects that you want financed so that you can attract, uh, whether it's private sector or concessional finance and so forth. And therefore, two initiatives uh, that sort of create that oper operationalization. We put together uh, a handbook for saying how we can do the blended, how we can do the de-risking. And then we created a country platform which is nationally owned, but also includes all partners. Mm -hmm. I can maybe speak about that in the next intervention, but there are practical ways, and we need to shed light on these lighthouse examples to create the hope, uh, and maybe what the Secretary General mentioned, the, ho the, the hope work, mm. uh, so that we can also uh, uh, inspire others and we can, we can have a positive mm. uh, story despite the gloom. Thank you, Minister. Luke, let me turn to you. Um, we were just talking about financial policy, if you will. Uh, it's also important at the in st state level, the individual country level, to think about industrial policy and what that looks like. Uh, the green transition, as we know, is not only going to create a huge opportunities for new employment, huge wealth creation. I mean, I, as a former business reporter, I really think about the green transition as literally the greatest wealth creation opportunity that we've seen in generations, maybe ever. If we're going to remake the world, a lot of people are going to make a lot of money. And yet, we've already seen that in individual industries, when there is that disruption, when all of a sudden coal workers in America suddenly don't have their jobs, for example, it creates real disruption. It can create a sense of dislocation. It creates political tension, what kind of industrial policies are you thinking about that are necessary to make sure that the green transition is equitable, including for those who were part of the previous economy? Yeah, it's clear that we can only succeed if we keep the trust of the people that are directly involved. Mm. And that means, indeed, that we have to make sure that the slogan that we use and con uh, continuously use, no one should be left behind, is also reality on the ground for every single person, every single worker. So in that sense, an industrial policy that we need worldwide is an industrial policy that creates well-paid jobs uh, and is focused on uh, the green transition and on the digital transition. But an industrial policy uh, cannot be limited only to those countries where we have the financial resources to, to finance the industrial policy. Uh, and that's the, the inequality today in the capacity for countries and regions to make this transition in an equitable way, in a just way. Uh, it's clear that if you talk about Western European countries where they recently, in the last years, decided about a coal exit, well, yeah, if you have the money, uh, if you have the time, uh, and if you have alternative jobs because you have a strong economy, yeah, we can talk about a just transition. But if you have to go out of coal mining in other regions, in other countries, where you don't have all these uh, resources and also financial resources, where you don't have alternative jobs, yet yeah, then you have people that are left behind. And unfortunately, today, we see um, 
everywhere in the world, but also in Europe, but also outside Europe, that we have a regional discrepancy. There are regions where we make this industrial policy for the future and where new jobs are created, uh, not only in the renewable energy, but in other sectors as well, and where the macro effect on number of jobs will be positive at the end of the day. But we also, unfortunately, have examples where we then see that countries where we have mainly extractive industries in fossil fuel, and where we have fossil fuel uh, um, um, turned uh, or uh, driven energy intensive industries, there we have um, closing downs of companies and we don't have an industrial policy in place there uh, where we can uh, create new jobs. So then jobs disappear and there is absolutely a negative balance. And so this inequality in the world is a reality today. And then regarding the financing, we just came out of the COP. Well, it's clear <coughs> that the developed countries have to assist in the financing of the um, climate action in the developing countries. Because if we don't do that, this inequality will only grow. And you will have winners and you will have losers. And this is not the world that creates trust or a world where people feel that they are taken on board. The whole topic of this uh, World Economic Forum is rebuilding trust. Well, rebuilding trust cannot be limited to only a number of countries. It has to um, um, include the whole world. So I think this is for us as a um, labor movement so important. We need to take everybody on board and it cannot only be the developed countries. It cannot only be a certain continent. It has to take everybody on board and industrial policy it's also about financial resources. So let's help those developing countries that don't have these uh, financial resources to indeed also invest in an industrial policy that can create uh, new jobs uh, in a climate-friendly way. Mm. Thank you, Luke. Joseph, let me turn to you. As CEO of Repsol, you're living this every day. You've got a fleet of energy producing uh, stations all over the world. Uh, many of those are still fossil-based, primarily gas, some oil. Uh, you've got a workforce that is very much a part of that economy, and yet I know you're looking forward towards this energy transition, towards the shift away from fossil fuels that was just agreed upon at COP28, and attendant with that, a huge turnover in your workforce. How are you thinking, first tell us, just about shifting your energy mix over the next several years, and then what does that mean for your workforce? Where are you gonna find the new workers you need? And what are you gonna do with the ones you have now? So first of all, thank you for, for having me uh, here. I think that this concept of uh, uh, equitable transition is crucial. Because I mean, if we don't develop, adjust an equitable transition, we will fail in mm -hmm. this effort. And from my point of view, I think that it's important to have a comprehensive and inclusive view of the transition. Otherwise, we are going to fail. I try to explain this concept. For instance, in Europe, uh, over the last years, we have been very focused on decarbonizing, forgetting all the rest of targets of an energy policy. The consequence has been, first of all, we forgot the security of supply, and we built dependence on Russia. Yeah. Secondly, we forgot the concept of affordability, and we have seen over the last two years European families suffering because they, many people can't or couldn't pay the energy bills. We forgot affordability for industries and jobs. I'm talking about the cement, the paper, mills, steel makers, uh, chemical sector. And they can't afford the energy cost in many regions in Europe. So industrial jobs have been threatened. You could say, okay, but we are doing pretty well because we are decarbonizing. So, but at the same time, we multiply by two, by three, or by four the LNG price in the world because we need it, because we forgot that we have to produce natural gas. We start buying natural gas everywhere. We make it possible for the global south, for emerging countries to acquire, to buy this natural gas. They have to shift from gas to coal and year after year, we are increasing the CO2 emissions dramatically in the world. So we are failing in our policies. And I think that, I mean, we have to start from this start point because I think that we have to rethink our energy policy. And of course, we have to be tough decar de decarbonizing, but with success, because now it's not true that we are decarbonizing. And I'm going to answer your question, putting a, a specific 
uh, example. I mean, I fully support, and I agree with, look, with your, 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 your statement, your intervention. For instance, we run five refineries uh, in Spain, five very competitive refineries. You could think, okay, refining is over because we are sustainable, we are not going to emit CO2, we don't need refineries, we are going to shut down these refineries, we are going to put an interpretation center, a museum, that is just, just transition, creating three jobs, paying them 1,000 uh, euros a, a, a month when the industrial workers, they, are, uh, uh, they have wages of three, four, five, or 6,000 uh, euros a month, so they are better jobs. So that is not the solution, but that is the consequence of an ideological approach to the energy transition. What's the view of Repsol? And we are applying, and we are fully work, working with our, our trade unions in this effort. First of all, we have to decarbonize the world, it's true. Secondly, decarbonizing is not electrifying. That's not true. Electrification is a part, an important part, and we are also part of this electrification process. But in coming 20, 25 years, a half of the economy probably, about 40%, I mean, put the percentage you want, is not going to be decarbonized. Uh, the aviation, trucks, uh, maritime sector, many industries. So we, we need to produce renewable liquids. So our report has been, we have to invest hard in our refineries to transform the feedstock. And more and more, we are introducing a feedstock, vegetal oils, recycled oils, animal fats. We are going to put hydrogen on track to produce renewable fuels. And the consequence is that thanks to this process, we are investing hard, and we are now more industrial jobs in Spain than we had 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. But if you take many regulations and many policymakers' statements, you say, oh, no, but I mean, you are not in the taxonomy, European taxonomy, because I mean, refining is out of this business. I mean, we have to broaden a bit our mind, because otherwise we are felt in this effort of decarbonizing Europe, we are, we are going to destroy many industries. We are increasing the CO2 emissions in the world. Sometimes we are exporting jobs and we are exporting emissions. Pollution. And at the same time, we are going to have a very unequitable transition. So we are going to fail and we want to succeed. So we are going to go on in this effort. Yeah. So much in there, uh, but, but I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of one of the first things you mentioned, which is this notion of uh, energy affordability. I think it, it is often lost sight of, and it's not just affecting families, of course, it's affecting economies. Yeah. Uh, I've been speaking to people this week who are really concerned about uh, <coughs> manufacturing, leaving Europe in, in a sustained way. And if once that leaves, it will be decades before it might ever come back. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so let me turn to you, please. Uh, Manpower Group, enormous, enormous staffing agency. You, you see these macro trends. You sort of see it from 30,000 feet where the labor pool is moving. Talk to us about what you're seeing when it comes to this green transition. Are, critically, there the, the, the job, excuse me, are there the individuals, are there the skilled people ready to take the green jobs that are becoming available? And if not, where is the training coming from that is going to get them ready for this next generation of jobs? And I think that is exactly the question that we need to think a lot about. It might be instructive to think about the last time we had this kind of major transition. And uh, you know, think back around 40 years ago when globalization really started to take hold. I don't think we knew the effects that it was going to have, but the positive effects were tremendous. You know, we, we increased the population, the living standards improved, so lots of things got much better for billions and billions of people. But just as Luke said, we left some people behind. And the labor markets bifurcated between the haves and the have-nots in terms of skills. We de-regionalized some areas. We, we, um, we saw people with lower skill sets having difficulties remaining in the labor markets. And overall, this polarized the, work, the workforce in a way that we're grappling with even today. So as we're now in this green transition, which cannot happen without a digital transition, which in itself cannot happen without a skills transition, it's going to be really important for us to be very deliberate in what we did not address last time, which was to have a skills transition at scale. I think most of the companies that are here at Davos that are undergoing these transitions, they have the resources themselves to make this transition. So when Josu talks about the skills transition that he has made, because you were early 
way early in your transition to more energy efficient, less carbon emitting refineries, um, you had to reskill your workforce. They had to do things in a different way, be engaged in the whole process. So that is not going to be the concern. The reality, though, is that that is not where the majority of employment is generated. So I think for governments already to know and think about the impacts of the green transitions, which I think is very related to the financing costs we talk about, you know, the big debate today and the big struggle for Europe is energy costs are, are half in the US compared to Europe. Mm. So if you think about manufacturing and others, how together with the IRA um, Act, how this causes a very big dislocation competitively for companies on where they want to make investments. Um, so you have a, that green transition. The digital transition, which enables the green transition, at this point is going to be disproportionately benefiting more developed countries because they have much more developed technology infrastructure. And if we've learned something today is that AI and other things, of all the things and topics we hear around AI, what's clear is if you don't have a strong digital infrastructure, uh, you're not going to be benefiting as quickly from the impact of the technology. And then lastly, all of this drives the need for a skills transition that can support both the green transition, which enables the, uh, or digital transition, which enables the green transition. So we have a, a, a big task in front of us. And frankly, this is an area which I think is underappreciated mm. in many cases. And the other part that I think is important to, to know, for all of the talk about the green jobs on mm. renewables, which are estimated to be anywhere from 5 million new job opportunities, good, well-paying jobs, just as Luke was referring to, uh, that represents 4% of the jobs that are going to evolve so that we have a workforce that is enabled, as enabled to be taking advantage of the green transition, augment their skills, and make sure that they have meaningful and sustainable employment as this evolution carries on. So it's not just the renewables. And I think that is, you know, you talked to Jose about the, um, you know, having an ideological position on what we can do with fossil fuels over time. Uh, I think my, my, my colleagues in the sector, energy sector, educate me on 80% of the, of the energy generated 40 years ago was from fossil fuels, and 80% of the energy generated today is from fossil fuels. That is the truth, that is the data. And so if we're not going to uh, severely impact costs, fossil fuels are going to be here way longer yeah. than our politicians talk about. I don't think we're honest in terms of the impact of costs that rapid transitions would engender. I think there are many new innovations driven by technology that can very quickly impact carbon emissions in existing industries. And to do that, you need to also transition the skills in those industries. Yeah. But I think the debate is somewhat skewed, and I would agree with Hozu, very ideological driven, not practical execution, operational, just as you said, Minister. Uh, that is such an important aspect of this, because we have to do it, but how to execute it is going to be really, really important for it to be successful and save the planet. Yeah, thank you so much. Two quick notes of housekeeping. I'm gonna do another quick round with my panelists, then we wanna hear from you. So please start preparing questions. Uh, secondly, I, I was remiss in not uh, pointing to a report that our friends at the WEF have prepared. Maybe you can put that slide up. They just did a report on this issue. Tons of data, tons of insight. So if we get the QR code, you can get that again. Minister, let's turn back. Will you take us sort of on the ground in Egypt? E enormous, enormous young workforce enormous opportunity, enormous need to transition the economy, to build out new green infrastructure, new green power. What is preventing you, others in government, from actually allocating the resources necessary from the private sector, from crowding in? What is, what is stopping that right combination of human capital and capital capital from coming together and allowing a country like Egypt to really be a leader in this transition, given everything you've got going for it, from the demographics to just the sheer need for affordable energy in a growing region? I don't think, uh, um, uh, I mean, I would phrase the question differently. Uh, what are you doing to push forward? Because Please. there's so much that uh, has happened since uh, 2014 Egypt. Uh, 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 you know, uh, we changed, we, okay, so when I say going from policy to practice, 
uh, governments need to take structural reforms sometimes that are, are enabling for the private sector to come in and for uh, uh, the youth to be engaged. And I'll give the example in 2014, a feed-in tariff was introduced when it comes to renewables, which then opened up the space for private engagement in renewable and wind projects. Uh, and also $4.5 billion of investments uh, through multilateral development banks to the private sector. And Bin Ban, which is one of the biggest solar parks uh, uh, in Africa, uh, was constructed. So this is where the green transition for us on the renewable side started. Uh, when you go back and look at this project, we have uh, SMEs that were led by youth also engaged in such a project, and this continues uh, till today. Um, what we have done as a government in June of 2023, we've updated our NDCs, the Nationally Determined Contributions, to bring forward uh, the energy mix to be 42% by 2030 instead of 2035. So there is commitment from our side to push that. Um, uh, the second point, uh, and this is uh, where the concept of country platforms has come in center stage at COP27 and at COP28, and I have to say that the the shift in the, in the climate narrative started really in Glasgow, you know, my impression when attending there and being there, where the, the multi-stakeholders came together, private sector uh, became more uh, pronounced in terms of uh, it should be part of the solution and, and the government should actually uh, allow that to happen, but also multilateral development banks and concessional finance and philanthropy can de-risk uh, and therefore we can push the envelope. <coughs> Um, uh, country platforms are a way to say, we can't force a transition on a country. It has to be uh, owned. It has to be owned by the country because of labor, because uh, of, of uh, uh, you know, you want it to be sustainable, so it shouldn't be one project and then you stop. It should be a path uh, towards decarbonization. So um, uh, we put together a country platform. It's the nexus of water, food, and energy, NWFE. It's pronounced in Arabic, Nuwafi, which means fulfilling pledges. Mm -hmm. And here comes the concept of, of finance, where it has to be accessible, it has to be affordable. And if I'm putting a multilateral development bank narrative, there should be additionality. Mm -hmm. So as I'm doing my climate work, I should not deprive other projects which are developmental, be it social projects or, or otherwise. So um, when you say what we are doing in the country, we're trying to create uh, a very clear projects uh, that can entice private sector to come in and also draw in the concessional finance uh, that uh, would uh, actually push the implementation. Three C's help us in this commitment from our side as government, clarity with respect to the projects, and then the credibility we have with our partners, be it the private sector that has worked with us since 2014, or the multilateral development banks and financiers that provide guarantees or blended, uh, or also, I need to mention that we did a debt swap with Germany mm -hmm. in uh, a mitigation project that is part of the uh, country platform, Nuafi. So many examples, and, and part of uh, WEF is uh, uh, knowledge sharing, country to country uh, exchange of knowledge and also south south and triangular cooperation which are very very much needed at this time mm. thank you so much minister look let's turn back to the issue of, of labor unions because mm -hmm. in the u.s we just saw last year this uh, extraordinary fight between the united auto workers and mm -hmm. the big car companies and one of the sticking points in those negotiations which really shut down much of the u.s auto industry for months and 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 had real economic consequences mm -hmm. was the issue of electric vehicles mm -hmm. as you think about the way in which labor participates in this green economy transition uh, how are you advising your members uh, and those in the labor movement about being willing to you know embrace the future but not get so in you know stuck in the past that it prevents the 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 new economies from coming forth there is this tension and, and i mean I, I i don't want to suggest that the the, <laughs> the corporations were blameless here but on both sides of the issue we had people digging in their heels and sort of trying to preserve their own status quo yeah provocative question, but I will also be provocative in my answer. Good. First of all, the strikes were not only about the um, electrification. Mm -hmm. It was about CEOs earning 50% wage increase in one year and the offer to workers of 20% in four years, mm -hmm. not catching up the inflation. But the electrification was indeed also an issue. Yeah. We embrace the future, but we want to be part of it. That's the point. We want to be part of the debates, how you are going to design this future. 
it's about our, the jobs, the, the, the families that have these jobs in your companies um, that want to know what will this future be for me, how I will be skilled, yeah? and will I be skilled. So workers' involvement, trade union involvement from the very start onwards is crucial in creating trust. How can you create trust if you are only faced with the decision how it will be implemented and then you see what it means for you? So workers' involvement is key in uh, indeed having the workforce on board. And that's what we do all over the world. Uh, and where you do it, you will, be see, you will see that you are success, successful. And indeed, also regarding skills, it has been raised. It's absolutely crucial. We have to do much more on skills and on skills training and on competences than ever before in the history of labor and, and, and work. Um, but this cannot be done only by public authorities. It, this will be this time be done by companies. Companies have to do much more on skills. And on skills, it cannot only be limited to those that are already highly skilled. No, you will have to take your whole workforce with you. Because what I see, and I'm not going to name any company, but we, that we see a lot of investment in those that are already highly skilled in the company, mm. but those that are going maybe to lose out in this whole transition, we don't care really about them. Mm -hmm. Wrong, because then you create the feeling that we can't embrace this future. So, and that's the point. So we, let's take the responsibility for all the workforce in your company. And that also means then that um, um, you have to create um, uh, jobs in the regions where jobs are lost. Because what we see today, and that's my last point, is that uh, companies make this transition, uh, companies do the scaling and the upskilling, but then the jobs are lost uh, and the new jobs are created in the same company but not in the same region, so they are created somewhere else. And then you might have skilled workforce somewhere where jobs are lost, but there are no new jobs. And then you maybe get out of this by a golden handshake to these people that you don't that you can't offer a new job, but what do you do with their uh, children? What is the future of these communities and these families in the region where they have been growing up? And then it's not only no one should be left behind; it's also critically no region should be left behind. And that regional uh, inequality we see happening today already in Europe, but also outside Europe. Yeah. Thank you, Luke. Well, so jump in here uh, as you think about this absolute matrix of challenges that you laid out from uh, workforce development to energy security to energy pricing to the need to transition to a low carbon economy to the reality that heavy industry is going to be a laggard in that transition. What policies are you looking for? What industrial policies do you most want to see that could start to unblock some of those roadblocks? So, again, I think that we need some kind of comprehensive view about that. I mean, when you were I was listening uh, to, to Luke. I mean, I, I, I agree with your point. I mean, we need, first of all, uh, up, uh, and again, let me, probably my point is very Eurocentric now, mm. because when we talk about uh, equity, uh, I think that this concept could be different in some regions and in, in some others. I mean, going to, let me use the term, Western or developed countries, what we need is a transition that has to be based on the skills and industrial and technological capabilities we have. And we have to look for the cheapest and the most efficient way to get this target of the transition. I'm going to put uh, an, an example. I mean, we are talking about uh, the automotive sector. Again, the, the target has to be mm. to reduce emissions. I'm not suspicious. Uh, 14 years ago, I, I, I personally put in, 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 uh, at work the first recharging uh, electric vehicle recharging service in Spain. So that is also part of our story. But I mean, this month, we are going to put in operation a plant in Spain, in, in, in the southeast of Spain, in Cartagena. And we are going to start producing 250,000 tons a year of a renewable diesel and renewable jet fully produced from wastes. Mm. So the impact of this, CO, this, this plant in terms of CO2 reduction is equivalent to 400,000 electric vehicles on the Spanish road. Do you know what is the number today of the electric vehicles on the Spanish road? Not 400,000. Exactly, exactly 400,000. What is the difference between both processes that Repsol, with any kind of subsidy, has financed, has developed this plant, giving an alternative 
to the refinery we have in Cartagena and giving opportunities to our industrial jobs, I mean, respecting the, the concept of uh, maintaining regions, maintaining industrial jobs that look developed, yeah. and the 400,000 electric vehicles, they have a cost of 4 billion euros for the Spanish taxpayers. So where is the, 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 the justice of every option? Mm. So saying that, we have a combined option. I, I know that the electric vehicle probably is going to be the best option, the best niche option in many places, but not for everything. Right. So we have an energy policy that has to be just, has to be equitable, and has to be based on the industrial and technological capabilities we have, not with no biases and with no ideological approach, approaches. And another example from other regions, because I mean, my view is very Eurocentric, but we have to rethink the concept of sustainable financing from my point of view. Mm -hmm. Why, for instance? Because, I mean, last, last week, or this week I was talking to a commissioner of the African Union. And when I was talking about transition, she told me, I mean, you talk about transition, but the problem is not transitioning, it's the access to energy. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing in terms of sustainable finance from our financing system? I mean, if someone has to develop a gas plant in the south, in the global south, we say, okay, no, you are going to develop hydrocarbons. We are not going to finance that, that because we are pure green and we are sustainable. So what is the consequence of this action? That probably this country has to burn coal to produce the power they need, increasing dramatically mm. the CO2 emissions in the world. So again, we are punishing the competitiveness of this country. We are actively increasing the CO2 emissions in the world and we are forgetting this comprehensive and global view we need to cope with the CO2 reduction target. Yeah, thank you. Uh, articulate and, and absolutely gets to this myriad complexities. I mean, no, no single action does not have a whole series of consequences that not only affect jobs, but also emissions and so much more. Uh, Jonas, before we turn to questions, uh, I do want to come back to this issue of displacement. And we've largely been think, talking uh, on this panel uh, about some of these issues in the developed world. But uh, you think about a company like, a uh, country like India, where you have cities where tens of thousands of workers, a whole cities, whole economies are really focused on, say, coal production. As you think about those types of facilities being wound down in the years ahead, how do you, as someone who thinks about staffing at a global level, imagine what to do with so much human capital, with so much labor? What do we do? Where, where, where's the alternative for those kinds of jobs? Small, small task at hand. Yeah, small task at hand. So I think what we can know is to look back at what's happened in the past. Had we been able to predict the Industrial Revolution and how many people would work in agriculture in 1910 versus 2010, and we would have realized it goes from 50% of the workforce to 2% of the workforce, yeah. we would have been very worried. But the reality is that human ingenuity and innovation drives opportunities for growth in areas that are very difficult to predict at a certain point in time, but you can develop skill sets that enable you to take advantage of those. Mm. So frankly, I'm a lot less interested in about, in, uh, sorry, a lot less concerned about the opportunities that the future will generate with the green transition enabled by the digital transition, as long as we make uh, the appropriate skills transition that benefits all. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look at the progress that India has made in terms of the digital transition yeah. in just the last four years, they have gone from a, you know, a reasonably difficult environment where exactly the same people had no access to public services, they didn't know how to engage directly with governments, always had to push through, um, uh, push through middlemen and, and creating all kinds of transactional issues. Now they have access through uh, handheld devices, cheap, to the point of financing, able to go straight into and ask for the services and be able to access those services much, much faster. Yeah. And all of this happened in four years. We would have said four years ago cannot be done, and today it's a fact, and India is often, often running. Um, so I think that's going to be important. But I think Luke is absolutely right, and 
in terms of the skills transition needs to happen in an equitable way. And I think we can look back for all of the concern around the speed. Most of the things that we talk about will have a bigger impact than we imagine, but at a slower pace than we're mm. projecting right now. And if I think back at the transition around, for instance, the banking industry, which has lost a lot of jobs, mm -hmm. but over a long period of time, well managed, you know, branches closing, technology having a huge impact, consumers doing it in a different way. And over time, we've been able to redeploy those and actually, you know, seen a very good evolution. Now, one of the things where I, where I probably have a contrarian view to look in this case is that all of the companies that we work with want to bring all of their workforce along for this transition. Mm -hmm. Why do they want to do this? They understand that the structural trend of demographic uh, evolution hmm. means you want to hold on to the workforce and develop your own workforce, which is much cheaper than to dislocate the workforce in one place and then having to find new people in another place. Yeah. So I'm a bit more optimistic because all of the companies that, that we work with, we see them investing more money in skills development today at a radical scale more than what we saw them do uh, just six or seven years ago. Because it's clear in the minds of organization, they will win with skilled talent. Skilled mm. talent is scarce in the labor markets because they're tight, and they will be tighter due to the demographic evolution. So they want to reskill and upskill their internal workforce before they have a strategy of only being able to bring new mm. uh, skills and talent in from the outside. That's a welcome note of optimism in a complicated discussion like this. Uh, we have time for a few questions from the audience, perhaps. Uh, please just stand, introduce yourself very briefly, and a direct question to one of our panelists. Yes, please. I saw two hands at once. We'll get to both of you. Please. Well, thank you. I, um, we didn't talk about the agriculture uh, transition today. It was a lot about the, the fossil fuels. So my question here is, why we don't make agriculture sexy again? <laughs> so we can get people on the land, back on the land. The one, one, I'm going to make a second question also, maybe that's to you, that's about the second, to the minister. As Rabobank, uh, we think it's so complicated because every multilateral institution has its own rules, every country has its own rules uh, in the blended finance. So we, we kind of almost lost, we are lost. So I would like to add one more C, Simple compliance. Mm. Thank you. Who wants to take the agricultural piece? Well, from a talent perspective, I'm happy to you know, start by saying you know, the progress that technology has brought to agriculture is amazing. And as I speak to companies in the agro sector, whether it's fertilizers, how you know, you've seen uh, John Deere, which is a big manufacturer of um, you know, agricultural machines and how they are now leveraging AI to become much more energy efficient, become much more accurate in how they deploy uh, fertilizer into the ground and, of course, work with, you know, companies that provide the chemicals to do that. I think we have reason to be quite optimistic. I don't think that this translates into, you know, massive uh, labor growth because I think the productivity opportunities mm -hmm. with the new mm -hmm. technologies, which is what we're talking about here, are tremendous. We're going yeah. to be able to continue to grow um, agricultural products with a more skilled workforce, with better equipment and more technology, I think, well into uh, the future. Thank and, you. Be, and because we are building a refining system that is going to be dependent on wasters, we are building a supply chain linked mm. to the farm and uh, Spanish sector yeah. that uh, is going to be crucial in terms of having access to, uh, to lipids coming from, uh, from, from farms, from some other ways, kind of wastes, from manure to produce biogas, to produce hydrogen. And the collateral effect is that we are creating activities in areas with a very low density mm -hmm. population in Spain, and we are going to integrate the farm and the manufacturing thanks to this view comprehensive view of the energy transition. Perhaps some growth in the agricultural sector. Can, can uh, I yeah, add very brief that? question and a quick answer. Thanks, uh, Jonathan Reckford with Habitat for Humanity. Very much related, it's hard to solve climate without residential, um, but the uh, unfortunate, unintended consequence of a lot of regulation has made it more expensive and slower to build and exacerbated the affordability crisis. How do you think about uh, how do we do a, uh, an inclusive uh, approach to uh, 
fixing, and do you see a job? There's, I think there's a huge shortage of skilled labor. I just wanted to go back to the agriculture, and it's uh, also uh, related. Food security is a priority, and uh, what happened in 2022 with the geopolitical issue has shown that um, it's, it's, it's fundamental, and it has pushed innovation in that, uh, in that space. When you say simple compliance across all IFIs with respect to blended, it doesn't exist. Nonetheless, uh, uh, there's more uh, uh, maneuvering and flexibility and agility compared to before. So that's why uh, it's sort of country specific, project specific, but we see uh, a more scope on the adaptation side. Uh, you, you are correct that this panel is very much on mitigation, but adaptation has not been uh, out of the discussion, be it at COP27, COP28 and onwards when we go to uh, uh, Uzbekistan and then uh, later on to, uh, to Brazil. So, so um, we can speak uh, after the panel on a lot of these yeah. examples. Mm. And how about to the housing stock issue? The housing, housing stock issue? Well, excuse me, the, the, the affordability. <laughs> okay. yeah. Great that that's where it's going. I have no idea about the affordability, but I'll go to the question around the skills that you asked about and the shortages on the skilled trades. And I think that's very much a question of misalignment between our understanding what is a good job versus what is not a good job or the perception. Yeah. And I think you know the dignity of meaningful and sustainable employment and skilled trades is largely mis- uh, understood in lots mm. of parts of the world and, and we as parents have a task and we as actors have a task to also educate uh, the world that you know these are well-paying great jobs that provide you know the opportunity to contribute to society and have lots of growth and as it happens are less impacted in terms of the technological uh, transition so I think that is the area that we need to emphasize because building affordable housing is going to be extremely important also in this uh, transition. Well, thank you. And you use such a critical word in that response, which is dignity. Mm. And I feel like that underlies so much of what we've been talking about, not only for the countries, in, especially in the global south, who deserve equitable financing to make this transition, mm. but also for the workers, those who are going to be displaced and those who are coming in to a new workforce and want to participate in the upside. So with that, I'm going to leave it. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you all. Have a good rest of your WEF. Thank you.